Welcome to Babelcom 5. This is episode 6 of Crusade, Ruling from the Tomb. And again, this is going by the DVD play order as I'm recording it. Um, this is, again, another episode not so much about trying to find a cure, but actually something that just sort of vaguely intersects with the fact that they're looking for the cure. Um, it is, however, I think it's the first episode in which Lockley actually appears. And I say that in that tone of voice because Lockley is in the opening credits all the time as if she's a major character on the show. And yet we've, we've only just seen her in the sixth episode by this viewing order. So that's rather curious because I'm not quite sure what the minimum number of episodes you have to be in before you can get sort of top billing. But this might well, you know, it probably requires you to be in about sort of maybe eight episodes. I'm not quite sure. I don't know why I've got eight in my head. Um, I have a feeling that might be something I heard about in Babylon 5 where you had to sort of appear in eight before you got sort of paid as if you were there full time or something. I'm not sure. I think I'm probably crossing my wires slightly there. But in any event, this this story basically revolves around the idea of um, a cult on Mars. Um, we're not, and it seems the cult itself is linked to the plague in so much as people have, have viewed it as sort of you know God's will being sicked upon the world basically, and it's a sort of like a sort of second Noah's Ark, it's a cleansing of the world um, so that only the, the righteous will survive. And they are going to uh, attack a conference that is happening on Mars relating to the plague because they view that people who are trying to stop the plague from happening are going against God's will. Um, so I think that's the, that's the basic premise of it. It's it's a little bit disjointed in a sense um, because, as I say, it, it feels almost like a sort of filler episode just to get... And the weird thing is, Lockley shouldn't even be there. Lockley is, as established by this, still on Babylon 5, and yet she's been sort of seconded to Mars to oversee this conference. But interestingly, that's because Franklin put her at the top of the list of people to run it. So it's actually Franklin's fault and she intends to repay him in good measure when she can actually go back down to Earth, which implies that Franklin was on Earth when the plague hit, because otherwise, logically, he would be there doing the conference. Um, so that's quite interesting. We also get um, a John Sheridan name check here in this episode as well. But let me let me take you through the episode a little bit further. And... We basically find that um, we, are, we are on Mars. I don't think it's ever announced that it's Mars, at least not until a bit later, but those familiar with Babylon 5 will immediately recognise the sort of the Mars setting of it. And, um, you know, we're, we're taken down to the surface on a shuttle a, bit, a little bit later on. So we begin with a sort of a sparring session going on between um, a, a Lieutenant Carr, who is Mars police, and Lockley. And... Um, it's only after they've been going at each other for a little while about the security arrangements that Gideon then turns up to sort of interject and say that, you know, he's also got a, a viable security concern going here himself because it's going to be Dr. Sarah Chambers of his ship who's going to be making the keynote address and they're gathering a lot of important medical types in the same room at the same time. So he is concerned that they're a very, very soft target for someone should they so choose. So he's going to kind of getting in the middle of it all. And the uh, the Mars officer is, is basically reminding Lockley that it's not her jurisdiction anymore because Mars is independent, which of course it is now. Um, that happened within sort of the Babylon 5 timeline, give or take. Um, so, you know, there is a there is a sort of a tension clearly amongst the sort of, um, you know, the relationship between Earth Force and the local Mars team. Now, I actually thought I'd seen her in another episode, but I have checked and Lieutenant Carr doesn't have any other Babylon 5 credits. So um, she's just sort of in this episode only. 
Um, this and this, I noticed that this seems to be the first time that Lockley and Gideon have, have ever met because they just sort of they introduced them, themselves. You know, they introduced themselves quite formally when they went um, at this first meeting, and um, we see their relationship develop a little bit during the course of the episode, which is which is good to see. And it, again, it makes sense given the sort of the you know the the, the opening credits featuring Lockley. So we then get a sort of an entertaining shuttle scene between Trace and um, Eilison and Darina. Now you may remember that Trace was the pilot that they picked up in, I think it was the first episode of the season as I'm watching it. Um, and he was on Eilison's dig team originally. So he's not actually Earth Force. And his role in this episode is rather curious because Yes, he's piloting the shuttle, which makes perfect sense because that's what he's good at. That's fine, but then he gets sort of involved as a as an ex foundationist and um, an ex inhabitant of Mars, and it's all sort of very very convenient that this random bloke who isn't even Earth Force, who they just happen to pick up for the mission, happens to be associated with the the person who's central to the plot, basically. But you know, I guess that's just that's how they've chosen to use the character interestingly at about this time peter davies name flashed up on the screen as the writer of the episode now you may well know him as a quite a major star trek writer i, I can't immediately recall if he's written other babylon 5 episodes because jms did so much writing but it is possibly he did an episode before um, you know, but JMS really started getting into his Babylon Five scripting, so possible. But in any event, you know, you would you would probably know him more from his Trek work, perhaps. Um, so we get the we get the Franklin name drop um, shortly afterwards as Gideon and Lockley are discussing how she came to be here, and interestingly, she knows him as a gambler, so he seems to have some sort of reputation within Earth Force as a gambler. You know, I'm assuming that because they haven't actually physically met before, it seems, but she's obviously heard of him. So that's quite interesting. And they do, they are sort of pinging off one another um, in a way that suggests either sort of almost kind of, you know, professional sort of antagonism or perhaps something else. So that was that's that was quite a little sequence. And she basically, you know, is, is taking umbrage at the fact that he thinks there could be a security problem because her middle name is security and he says that as long as her surname isn't breach <laughs> then they'll be fine which i thought was i thought that was quite a nice little and um, yes a nice little bit of quippage there um so chambers then arrives on mars and she gets almost immediately gets gets hit on by a a, a very sort of god-fearing chap who offers her a drink but then um the Mars cop arrives to, to take her to meet Gideon and Lockley. And um, that's because there's been a murder already. Um, and we've seen someone attack just before they came down to Mars, basically. And there's been um, a, what was described by Gideon as a bisected infinity carved on his back, which is delightful. Um, and apparently this is indicative of a doomsday cult called Sacred Omega. And the reason that Gideon knows of this cult, and it would have been odd if he knew about it randomly, but apparently they, they, they're known to him because they killed a friend of him on, a, on another Earth ship. So he knows that they are prepared to kill and he knows that they are fully committed to their particular cause, which is this sort of, you know, non-interference with the plague, basically seeing the plague as God's judgment upon the Earth. So... We, we then discover that when they're going back up to the ship with the corpse for forensic examination, the shuttle pilot wanted to be a priest and he knows the deceased. Um, so, I mean, you know, the odds of that are, you know, monumentally slim, it has to be said. But apparently this the guy who's been killed was involved in the foundationist organisation, which I think Franklin is also a part of. Well, not that particular one, obviously not that branch, but as I recall... Franklin from Babylon 5 was a foundationist um, so we're seeing a sort of you know a sort of a theme that that kind of belief system is is, is not unpopular in, in at this particular time so 
he's he then gets quite heavily sort of interrogated on the way back up by Lockley, who wants to know, you know, what his past relationship with the man was and whether or not anything might have happened that could clue them in on what's happening now. But Trace really sort of shuts her down quite hard because whatever happened, he clearly doesn't think it's relevant and nor does he want to relive it. So it's kind of curious and there's a question mark there. But interestingly, Gideon backs him up as a member of his crew, which Lockley is not impressed by because she thought it was it was her her show, basically. So the other aside I'll just mention here is that I was racking my brains to think if we've ever seen the inside of an atmospheric shuttle before Crusade. I think we did see one in the Call to Arms movie. But oftentimes we've seen just the Earth transports which aren't atmospheric. And because it's got a sort of it's got three command seats at the front of it and at least another four passenger passenger seats behind it. So it's quite big. But I remember that in Call to Arms, it, they came down with Marines and stuff as well. So I'm now sort of thinking, was that a, is that a standard size for the shuttle? Because it seems quite spacious um, as, the, as, as sort of, you know, small ancillary ships go in this universe. So I'll, I'm going to have to delve into that one. Perhaps that'll be a subject of another video. But um, basically, you know, Lockley remains less than impressed with Gideon and has a word with him when they're back on the Excalibur about, about his, his behaviour. And... It's apparent that their styles are quite similar, which is kind of why they're, they're butting up against each other. And um, meanwhile, on the, on the surface, uh, Max Allison is sort of uh, won out over Trace because he's had to go back up. So he's now getting first dibs on Darina to sort of show her around because they he actually grew up on Mars. But he explains that he was kept in a, in a quite a sort of closeted fashion by his parents to keep him out of harm's way. But when he did manage to break free of that, he came to the less salubrious areas to see what life was really about, unquote, unquote. And he rapidly discovers that um, just it's good old times because he immediately gets his uh, wallet lifted. And of course, Darina, being a thief, is less than impressed by that thief's uh, skill set. So again, almost against her better judgment, she chases after Eilerson after he chases after the thief because Eilerson has rapidly found himself outnumbered. So Darina goes in like a sort of howling banshee and clobbers, clobbers the thief that, cl that was about to clobber him and um, retrieves his wallet for him. And then they, uh, they make themselves scarce fairly rapidly thereafter. But it's nice to see them having a, a, little, a little adventure on the side. And... Um, the, the the results of the autopsy on the on the chap is is basically that the his attacker was a human which we we already knew because we'd seen it and interestingly um, I think it was Gideon that said that basically that narrows it down to ninety percent of the Martian population so ten percent of Mars is not human which is interesting <coughs> so Lock Lockley says to uh, Gideon, in the course of this conversation, do you know what you are? And Gideon says, ruggedly handsome, in a sort of, a slightly sort of hopeful fashion. And she just sort of looks at him, because that's, it's quite entertaining. There's a good bit of banter going on between all the characters in this episode, which is one of the strong points of it. I mean, I didn't, I can't say that I particularly liked this massively as an episode, but, you know, there was a certain amount of, of, character growth or at least character interaction going on here which was which is quite nice to see um no sign of galen on this one this is a very very galen light episode for once which is relatively unusual um because he's he, you know he's had a lot of airtime of late so it makes sense that he gets sort of stood down at some point um and as we know he does head off from time to time just to sort of do his own thing so it's not that surprising here so um, Lockley and Gideon declare a, a degree of a truce so that they can have some downtime to themselves because they've been all wrapped up in the security arrangements and everything else. And um, over the course of having dinner in Lockley's apartment, it turns out that uh, uh, John Sheridan is Gideon's hero, which um, and 
he, he asks Lockley a particular question, as in, has she ever been under him? <laughs> Which makes her sort of splurt out her drink, because, of course, G uh, Gideon doesn't know that she was once married to him. Um, so, ironically, he's he sat there describing him as a soldier, a statesman, a president. Um, and, of course, she's having to sort of sit there knowing all this very, very well, given her relationship with him. But that, what was interesting about that, though, is that the comedy value aside... Him being described as a statesman and a president was was interesting because I thought maybe the statesman progression happens when he moves to be in charge of Babylon 5 and takes Babylon 5 into independence. Um, that might be what Gideon is referring to there, that, you know, his that's his sort of his development trail leads him to go that way because I was thinking that the first time he was a statesman was when he became president actually but <coughs> excuse me I can see there being an argument for for you know the, the, the actual command of b5 being a, a statesmanship type position um they they sort of land upon calling him Matt and her Elizabeth when they're you know off duty and um, she then reveals her past with John Sheridan, just as he's have taken a drink. <laughs> so she times it. She times it spot on to to, to, uh, to generate the same effect in him as his original comment had on her. So that was quite entertaining. Um, we then see that the the chap who originally bumped into Sarah Chambers is the guy who is basically leading this uh, this sort of terrorist cell of um, Sacred Omega. And he's hearing voices um, of a Joan and um, who speaks in a, in a French accent for reasons that become apparent. And it's, it's basically he's got two accomplices and they've got a, sh a big cache of, um, you know, you know sort of, um, explosives and weapons, which are ex Mars resistance weapons, basically. So um, that's that's what's going to lead to um to, to you know the potential issue down the line for the conference so we, we then go um back to the bar that Alison and Darina um entered a little while ago where um Alison has made some some new friends with blokes at a table because he's buying drinks and um Trace has joined them and he does indicate in the course of the sort of drink fueled um conversation that something went wrong when he, he was with the foundationist order and he doesn't really go into any sort of real detail he sort of pulls himself back from starting to say something about it and then he goes outside separately whilst um Darina and max well max teaches Darina how to dance basically because she said she never had time for it before now because she's been too busy just trying to survive so Max then starts to show off some very adept dance moves and um, poor old Trace starts getting the stuffing kicked out of him because someone's been waiting for him outside the bar. Um, apparently because he knows someone who they don't want him to see basically and to be able to identify. So he gets a knife pulled on him but manages to, 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 to knock the knife out of the guy's hand but he's still getting a pummeling. And then... Darina realises that he's not in the bar anymore and goes out to look for him with Max. And Darina then holds a knife to the guy who's holding a knife to him. Um, but just at that point, the Mars cop turns up and point blank shoots him in the back of the head. <laughs> because he hadn't dropped the knife by the count of three. She shoots him on two. So um, apparently that's the way that she rolls. So they go back to the bar to sort of recover and draw their breath. And they identify his assailant as an ex-member of the Mars Resistance, um, whose DNA is apparently not on file. And Lockley sees this as too much of a coincidence. <coughs> so they show Trace all of the people who are attending the conference. And he identifies one as Andre, well, one is identified as Andre Sabot. But that isn't the name that Trace knows him by. And it's the guy who ran into Chambers as she arrived. And the guy who was hearing the voices. So they now have an, an identification. And Lockley sort of, you know, calls um, 
Gideon, who's at the conference, say, "Look, you know, we, they know who the they know who the, where the problem lies, and he's already started the detonation countdown." But realizing what's at stake and what their belief system is, Gideon very cleverly interrupts Chambers as she's sort of doing her introductory speech, and it, and he has to he tells the conference that actually the plague is going to move much faster than they think it had. So but there's no time left, basically. They're not going to, they're never going to have time to, to fix it. Everyone's doomed. You, you should leave now and go back to your families. And the voice in Sabo's head says, it's okay, you don't need to blow them up anymore because they're just going to go home and it's all going to happen. And, and so God's will will be done. So he cancels the countdown. But then when he goes back to his cache of weapons, of course, they get jumped en masse and all of the team are killed. Um, Carr takes a shot to the shoulder but is fine. And um, Trace kind of speaks with Sabo um, a little bit before he, before he passes. So it turns out that the voice that he'd been hearing was actually Joan of Arc. Um, hence her French accent. And apparently he'd written in a journal and everything that she was saying actually were things that Joan of Arc uh, you know had attributed to her so whether or not that's because he'd learned about her or because it really was Joan of Arc talking to him and through her God talking to him is is sort of left up in the air and there's a little bit of a sort of religious debate in the bar at the end between Alison Dorina Chambers and um, Trace but um, you know they talk about martyrdom and you know it's all that good stuff and Lockley's sort of casually invites Gideon to Babylon 5 if he happens to be in the area at all you know because obviously when you've got a huge ship like the Excalibur you can just rock up to Babylon 5 at any given point in time when you're trying to cure a plague but apart from that um and apparently the um the ruling from the tomb name for the episode is reference to T.S. Eliot um, and you know things around martyrdom and so on and sort of they talk about religion be, being used as, as a justification for various things other than what it was originally intended to promote i.e people getting on with each other so um the other really odd thing about this episode was that the um the outro music was really odd it was kind of this really sort of odd clanky clanky mess of it was just odd um, I don't know what was going on there at all I mean it's I don't I'm not a fan of well I mean, I don't I don't mind this music but I, I'm I remain a, a firm fan of the original Babylon 5 mu uh, music by Christopher Frankie and this this ain't it and that definitely wasn't it whatever the outro was but it, it did remind me of that sort of that sort of late 90s kind of sound when people just started being quite experimental with stuff you know i just I, I didn't i didn't particularly like it i think i expect steady state intro and outro musics basically and i'm pretty sure that wasn't standard um maybe it was just me i don't know but it seemed odd anyway um so this i know that this this episode does make sense in these sort of the running order you could you could substitute it in anywhere. It wouldn't really matter. It's not particularly dependent on, on anything that's gone before, I don't think. So, as I say, it's not vital where this one lands. So, but it does, <coughs> it does work in the sense that it introduces Lockley before she's been introduced in any other episode. So, it does make sense that it, it could come now in the, the running order from, from that point of view as well. But. I mean, you know, I'm now very nearly halfway through Crusade, which is a strange thing, and we just don't seem to be any nearer any sort of significant leads or, you know, a sort of a particular train of of action that might lead to a, con a conclusion. But of course, as as we know, you know, this this series was cut very, very short. So that, that perhaps isn't that much of a surprise, given that we're only six episodes in. You know, whatever the the overarching plan was for this particular series we just don't really see it yet so um as i'm a little bit behind with these at the moment i'm going to try and crack on with another one but as you can, as you can hear my my throat seems to be having other ideas but um you know it is one of those it's it's an okay episode it's like a season one 
Babylon 5 episode, it is it is what it is. It takes us to Mars, which is always interesting to see what's going on there, kind of post-independence. You'll notice in actually um while I think about it, in the in one of the shots there's a very clear reference to a Bradbury on a sign, which is Ray Bradbury, who I believe did quite a few books set on Mars. He was a very well known science fiction author. So that's why that um, that name is very very prominent in some of the scenes, which I thought was 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 quite 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 a quite a clever little sort of tip of the hat for that um, for that particular reference. So um, yeah, Babylon Five was doing you know references even 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 as far back as the nineties. So fair dues. Um, yeah, it's interesting about the foundationism thing. I've never really read up on it myself, but I seem to remember it was more of a more of a belief system that's it's not sort of i don't think it's out and out religious i think it's more of a sort of general belief in the sort of the you know the universe being aware or something rather than being a single deity led kind of religion so not mono uh, what's the right word for it i forget what the, uh, there's a word for having a single god system rather than a multi-god system but you can probably tell me um anyway I think I will I will leave it there because I, you know it, this one it is what it is. It's just it's a story about the potential bombing of a medical conference. Basically, it's it's, it's no more apart from the fact that it's set on Mars. It, it could be any other story set anywhere. Basically, so you know in that in that respect, it's not massively science fiction driven. It's just a murder mystery type story. That's all it is. So um, yeah. On that note, I will um, leave it there. Do like and subscribe as ever. Um, check out my Road Home review. And um, I will see you for another Crusade episode. Cheers for now.